quickly as possible, but I have this strange sounding um, title, strange title talks, ship sounding, waterway, port city, and hinterland. And the sounding, of course, uh, in terms of maritime maps is the sounding of the depths, right? And so for ship sounding nowadays, with the post Panamax ships, uh, the depths are quite clear for shipping channels. They need to be as deep as or deeper than the post Panamax. So the ship is actually doing that sounding. But it's also towards the end trying to think about new ontologies and practices with riparian um, engagement and river engagement, speaking with the river, and new kinds of methods that are trying to perhaps better inform uh, the kind of the cavalier engineering uh, that's been done up to this point in the country through agencies like the US Army Corps of Engineers in that way. So I'll try to, I'll try to go through and explain some of the things. Um, we, I feel like we're lucky because we have, you know, across the, here and across the university, we have a great group of um, folks who work with the environment as well as um, political ecologists over in, in geography, for example, who are very helpful for us. But this, I mean, this idea of nature uh, again and again is a very complicated thing, right? This idea, good old Raymond Williams, the idea of nature contains, though often unnoticed, an extraordinary amount of human history, right? The way we create or engineer nature um, is something that we've always done, right? So it's, it's this, it's that we, we co-construct one another, nature and society in that way. And I think this talk is, is a lot about that. So the Dean asked that I talk a little bit because I'm on the lecture committee, so I'm kind of cheating here. I got a great person to speak. His name is me. Um, uh, so that, let's think about infrastructure first as we do in, in the infrastructure seminar that we have, large technical systems, right? Um, so a little bit what I was saying before, um, this idea of the development of technology is contested and controversial as well as constrained and constraining. So I think it's helpful to think about modernity uh, in terms of infrastructure, right? Because again, we have this kind of mutual um, sort of codependency, co-construction that's happening. So they're large technical systems. Um, they, they certainly uh, are territorial. Right? This idea that the state, um, the state operated in a form of territorialization for capital above all, above all through planning, production, and regulation of large scale, scale infrastructure configurations that serve as general conditions of production on differential scales. Right? So Neil Brenner, who's done a lot of work on scale, um, and certainly when we think about uneven development, infrastructure is, is very important in how uh, global value is created and um, transported in that way. The, the transportation itself is the production of value in uneven geographies, or through uneven geographies. And perhaps closer to our uh, professions, Pierre Belanger, this idea of landscape as infrastructure. As ecology becomes the new engineering, the project of landscape infrastructure, a contemporary alignment of the, discipl the disciplines of landscape architecture, civil engineering, and urban planning, is proposed here, right? So it's this idea that, uh, say, uh, a water system, a, a waste system, that may have been that matrix which governed the extent of urban growth, how far it was extended. Now we can understand a, a lot of landscape um, is, is engaging with this idea that landscape as a matrix, right? Landscape as a de possible developmental matrix and understanding it as an infrastructure as well that can be sort of worked with, um, I suppose, optimistically, this idea that it can be worked with, although I think the challenges remain. Um, and then, so, so categorically, this idea of port cities, um, right? So what is it specifically? That it's a port that makes port cities different than other cities is no more than a statement of fact. But the explicit, the explicit conscious use of the term entails more. It means that the economic, social, political, and cultural life of that city is also predominantly determined by and has to be analyzed in the light of that port function. A complex, all-embracing superstructure which creates both the challenge and possibility to assess just how port city functional differences 
um, affects its character, right? And then back to this idea of co-construction. In the beginning, the beginning, the harbor made the trade, but soon the trade began to make the harbor. So we, of course, know the trade republics, good old Venice, and, uh, and you can see Amsterdam to the north, right, and to the right. Is that your right? No, it's to your left. Yes? Um, the Netherlands is clearly a waterway, water system um, that involved extensive engineering, right? Landscape engineering from, from way back. But a lot of work happening now in the, the Netherlands. The Netherlands really sort of leading the way for new forms of water management. Um, once upon a time, impossible uh, there. They're actually allowing flooding, controlled flooding, right? And this is kind of revolutionary for them because for them, it's an existential proposition. Right? If they allow it too much, they no longer exist. So uh, uh, having the biggest port in Western Europe in Rotterdam, um, it, it's sort of a central hub for port city research um, and sort of port city futures, as they like to consider themselves, which we'll talk about in a bit. But in understandings of the geographic relationship of port cities, shall we do some of this? Does this work? Yeah, how is it, Tom? Yeah, for no reason whatsoever other than to play with it. Um, uh, Bird and his any port model looked at it in sort of this um, early 60s modern understanding, right? The forelands, the immediate forelands, the port as kind of a fulcrum, the immediate hinterland, uh, hinterland, and then this kind of discontinuous hinterland. Georgia works very well for this, right? If you think about um, the, the inland ports that are being set up um, throughout the state as you go through, and certainly free, um, the sort of warehousing that's very extensive in Georgia, um, even though it's kind of a very generic model, I think it's fairly easy to understand. And where we'll focus, oftentimes this is called the last mile in logistics for planning, trying to get um, goods to port in that last mile without choking up traffic too much, creating too much truck air pollution, the proper industrial land uses, conjugating them with business opportunities on the waterfront. It's, it's quite knotted up there, right? Well, what we're going to look at um, is also the approach channels and shipping channels, which also, um, in terms of dredging, become important sites as well. This is just some other examples of work in port geography that sort of try to, tries to understand how uh, economic activities and spatial configurations happen with relation to new um, port development over time. Um, logistics, yes. Again, my, my class has done a lot of work on this idea of logistics, right? It's the management of goods across space and time, originally a military tactic for arms deployment, today logistics leads corporate strategy for the international integration of production and distribution, right? The supply chain metaphor conjures a naturalized, rational sequence of links, which the, through the power of technology can now distribute traditional factory floor assembly line across the world, right? But these are in fact not seamless and they are not invisible, right? They, as Claire Lister describes them, they're a complex interplay of technology, culture, commerce, distribution, and their respective constitutive politics that converge and part dynamically. Right? So this is the good old fun 30,000 view of trade happening right before our eyes, right? Container ships, airplanes that traverse you can get online and see the maps and you see the dynamism of the little dots. Um, so in this way, it's a kind of a representation um, to, to start to understand the complexities of these things. But with logistics, um, I, again, in my infrastructure class, we look at this, right? This is the Russian campaign of 1812, a geographic understanding of Napoleon's uh, expedition into Russia. But in terms of the charting of it, um, uh, in log logistic space, um, this is a very famous um, understanding of that same project um, understood in layers, right? And sort of these infographic layers that I'm sure uh, folks in our college are used to or understanding, but you can see how troops lost 
temperature, et cetera, et cetera, and it sort of shows, in a way, logistics space. If, if cartographic space is perhaps more Cartesian or sort of showing one kind of representation, this is conveying something else. Um, just, I don't know if you remember, once upon a time, we had the Suez Canal get blocked up. It feels like a while ago for some reason. It wasn't that long ago. When was it? Maybe 2021? Anyway, the point being only that it, it sort of captured the world's imagination for a second. And um, it's, it showed how important these channels are and how important choke points are. Right? So it, 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 is, it is precisely when it fa it, failure expresses power. So it's when it's not working that we understand how distribution systems, how important they are and also where power happens very much, right? So you can also think of, say, when blackouts happen or electricity is stopped in certain countries for certain hours. This too is a good example or a representation of um, power, citizen power, very often in that way. This, is, I know it's kind of a more loaded image, but this is during the withdrawal of Afghanistan. This too, in a way, is a logistics of people that we're used to but here, the sort of, the, the finger, right, the fingers here, can I do it? Yes, there, these are, I think, called airplane fingers where people board. Um, that kind of security system that we think of as so precise is just completely hacked, and the airplane really doesn't serve them much in that way, this kind of advanced technology just sort of sitting idle in that way. Um, in, in Georgia, I think logistics is a key um, part of our economy, right? It's, it's in a way, Georgia is a la uh, an infrastructure regime. And so I've done some work on uh, uh, logistics in terms of biomass in the southern part of the state, as well as um, immigrant detention, also in the southern part of the state, but in, um, in Atlanta as well. But this was sort of thinking about bodies as logistics. I know that sounds sort of like an intellectual exercise, but it, it was committed to the, um, to the humanization of what are otherwise dehumanizing practices. But it was through that lens of logistics. Um, again, logistics centralized. This is the Parisian train system, which clearly, um, rather than sort of circular um, networks, it's very centered on Paris, right? So that's clearly a politics expressed in uh, transportation networks, right, in that way. And then here, if we go way back, um, we can even get ourselves to Savannah. Now, once upon a time, there was this kind of Savannah centrality with the train system here in Georgia, when they still had passenger trains, um, as well as, of course, freight that was happening. Which gets me to the Savannah Harbor Deepening Project, right? Um, let's see. We'll go. Um, this is a picture, I think you know, of um, the rivers of the country and good old Savannah River. I might be too bright. Tom, oh, there we go. I think it's this one here. Someone's going to say I'm wrong, and they'll probably be right, but that's okay. But the Savannah River, right? The Savannah River is approximately 300 miles long. The Chattooga and Tallulah Rivers join in the Savannah headwaters to form the Tugaloo River downstream at Hartwell, the Tugaloo joins the Seneca, and then from there it goes down to the Atlantic Ocean. So the tributaries drain approximately 10,000 square miles total into the Savannah, right? Um, and it begins as a port town, right? So as we know, good old James Oglethorpe uh, thought about uh, ships that drew 12 foot water can ride within 10 yards of the bank, right? And it's sort of this foundational Savannah project um, of trying to grow crops that Brit, the Brits didn't have to import any longer, right? So, but it was, even from the get-go, competing with Charleston to see who could have that main port function. Um, architecture hydraulique, right? Sort of just only to show that a lot of um, hydraulic architecture in the Corps of Engineers for the U.S. is very much influenced by the French Corps of Engineers and Latrobe, um, and so things get going here in the early part of the 19th century. Um, and that um, sort of intervention and in landscape engineering 
um, that the Corps is charged with to, for commerce and navigation, then um, it's certainly very important for our state, right? You have the main rivers, which were the form of transportation. So in order to export cotton, you had to be about five miles from the river, the main river system for a long time. And then after the War of 1812, um, you began to move indigenous populations further, further west, and the train will eventually, um, oops, can I go back? Help, Tom. Yes, the train will begin to access places that the river no, couldn't before, so this, then you sort of activate those places through access, the train, and that's why you move folks off, because those then can be moved into production in that way. Um, this uh, is just to sort of show this aerial view we cut to 19, the World War II, right, in the early, around the 1940s, when Savannah um, is part of the logistics um, regime that needs to export military equipment to World War II. And so um, the port needs to expand, and it does, into um, that area where it is today, with the Garden City. But this, only to say that we had this fascinating water experimentation station in Vicksburg, Mississippi. Maybe we can all take a field trip one day. Um, where they actually, in this beautiful hall, built an entire representation of the Savannah River and Savannah, which I think is fascinating. Just thinking about the possibility and understanding tidal, it's a tidal port, right? So trying to understand how tides will impact water management in that way. Um, this then uh, just shows the projects of electrification, hydroelectric projects um, in the 1930s and 40s and 50s that also became essential to um, the state's um, generation of electricity, right? Um, there's good, good books on this. And, you know, the TVA up the road, where Professor Pardue's from, uh, <laughs> is also an example of cheap southern electricity, right? It's no coincidence um, if we think of uneven development that New York regional planners had an interest in southern landscapes precisely for cheap electricity through resource extraction, right? Or the processing of resources to generate that in that way. This then becomes that new um, port. I'm seeing if you can see over there, which is where it is now, which was state docks, which was built on the Whitehall plantation, which is exactly what it sounds like, a plantation, that um, these rice plantations that were there. But you, again, you have this kind of layering of a logistic sector through historic uh, economic patterns, I think. Um, OK, this just gets us to today. Um, I'm jumping fairly quickly through the history. But so the Port of Savannah now is the, f if you sort of think of La Los Angeles, Long Beach, they're oftentimes put together. So it's either the, sec the fourth or the third most important uh, container port in the country, right? So in a way, it's a port with a quaint little city next to it, right, as an appendage. Um, so this is something that the, you know, you think of the, the one of the fastest growing ports in the country, certainly, uh, as I said, sort of outsized in its nature compared to the city itself. And we also think of, say, Atlanta's airport, the biggest in the world. It's something that George is very invested in this way. Fourth, you can just see some of the characteristics um, of the Garden City Terminal. And then, um, I guess what Alan Berger and Charles Waldheim called the logistics landscape, this kind of, these warehousing um, geographies that surround ports, and now airports as well, right? You can see the ones there, and they're growing. Industrial real estate is very expensive in Savannah now this way, right? But the reason why the port, uh, th the dredging project is proposed is because um, the Panama Canal uh, is, is expanded to be able to handle what they call the post-Panamax ship, and with this fifth generation post Panamax ship scale, um, it would, was going to create choke points for the depth of the Savannah Harbor, which was only at 42 feet, and the ship is about 48 feet. Um, 
in terms of the birth. So this was the, the dredging project was um, proposed in the port had, or rather, yeah, the shipping channel had been dredged in the early 90s from 38 to 42. Um, so in the late, they didn't think it was going to be much of a problem, but in, when they proposed it in 98 to go from 42 to 48, kind of all hell broke loose. It was um, litigious um, action wherein um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the National Marine Fisheries Service, and the Environmental Protection Agency all had to sign off on the mitigations that were going to be necessary for this deepening. Right? So this just to show that the deepening was happening at ports throughout the country, that that kind of competition, uh, port competition, is related to the rail service that each port has, as well as the dear, distance to the nearest interstate. Um, and though, so this is that project, right? It's about um, 40 kilometers, and you are going to go from 42 feet to 48 feet, which is a lot of dredge, right? You can see the mun municipal water intake that's far up there. You've got a wildlife reserve, the city. This sort of gives the overview of it. Um, and this, which is something a student put together, which is fun, just to, to give you an understanding of size, you know, the bigger size of that ship. It's very nice. Our own little Bosphorus. <laughs> uh, what's that? I like it when of anything. So again, you have, it's, it's a node where environmental features rub up against each other quite closely, right? Sort of neo-industrial um, and wildlife. Uh, one could argue contested spaces in that way. Um, uh, yes, and so these, the, the mitigations that were required from this, from those various agencies, um, doubled the, the bill. It was going to be about a half a billion. And then with these kinds of mitigations, it, it got bumped up to a, a billion dollars, right? And a lot of it, um, or a key part of it, was this oxygenation injection system. Uh, in order to protect the sturgeon, the Atlantic sturgeon and the short nose sturgeon, right? The sturgeon ten is right millions of years old. I'm sure people know this more than I do, but it's on the endangered species list. So this is why, because we sort of have an illegal un, uh, definition in some cases of ecology, this is the kind of the the star to be saved. One imagines. Anyway, I'll get to that. We get, so this is just the, some shots of the dredging in process, in progress. Um, there, you sort of can see it moves. And here you can see what's going beneath the surface and sort of digging up that dredge, right? It's sort of, dis it is a disturbance, fundamentally a disturbance. And going, again, nearly 40 kilometers from I'm mixing up metric systems, but say four feet, 40, 42 feet to 47 feet. Also, in, as a part of the lawsuit, they said not 48 feet, 47 feet. Of course, when dredging ha happens, they probably are going down to 50 feet because it silts every year, and they just say, yeah, close enough. It gets us to two years from now. But somehow, legally, the one foot was very important. Um, the, it, it was completed last year in March. Almost, almost a year ago, um, all, all the projects, but what's left is the mitigation. This is just an example of some of that dredge um, that is now being dried in various drying facilities, right? And so it's very expensive to store this and to process this. Um, it's once upon a time it was used to reclaim, uh, but now there are various sort of ideas of how it can be used, including as we'll see, the, the core and its engineering with nature group, which some of our faculty work with, I think. I think John, Professor Calabria, I think, works with them. Um, uh, so it's interesting because you think of a port as, uh, as a service, right? But there's also a mining aspect to this, right? So even, even if you think of primary mining and then service of process and trade, it's calling upon the, now calling upon the port to do other things, right? And this, this gets into, I think, I think it's helpful to talk about this within anthropologies of extraction and the mining 
um, processes, say, of electric car batteries that's happening, computers, um, telephones, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's a long time it's just been seen as waste and byproduct, but now it's actually, I think, moving into a new realm under the auspices of sort of more ecological practices, but more sort a kind of a mining, I think, in that way. This, the sort of the state, save the sturgeon. And this is some shots of that, um, some of the oxygenation pro, uh, infrastructure that's there that I think the outlay, the first outlay was $100 million, and now it's just going to be woven into the budget uh, on a yearly basis of something like $5 million a year. Um, so the, the, you require dredging maintenance, and now you're going to have these sort of ancillary maintenances as well for budgets. Um, and this is just shows a little bit about how that oxygenation process works and the testing. At various points um, along the river, what they do is um, put this dye in the water, and if the oxygen has been properly taken in by the river, then it will sort of go away. But apparently if the oxygen isn't quite dissolving properly, it won't. The oxygenation is required just because with um, the salt intake, when you make it deeper, more salt water comes in and it becomes more dangerous. But in seeing this, um, I'll, try to, I'll try to pivot here, but in seeing this, you see almost an anthropomorphic aspect to it. It's as if the river's bleeding, right? Um, and, and this begins to get into this kind of idea that of, um, of listening, or listening to the river, which is a new sort of practice and uh, approach to resources um, that pretends that somehow, and I, when I say percent, I'm not being patronizing, I think it's trying to come up against what uh, Neil Smith called the subject-object differentiation of us with nature, right? The idea that we need to conceive of nature as without rather than us within. Um, and so it's perhaps in this, the, the kind of the dual challenges of identification as well as somehow being able to advocate for non-human species and environments that are beginning to be the kinds of methods that people are looking into. So um, the Ashley Kars, I'll just get into this a little bit, but Ashley Kars has done good work on this idea of mitigation and how uh, it involves this idea of what survives, what dies. The sturgeon survives because it's on an endangered species list, but certainly the complexity of an ecosystem is hard to define simply through legal structure, right, in that way. So um, if it is a disturbance ecology, um, Monica Turner, who, who's highly regarded and did a postdoc here with Eugene and Odom back in 86. It was the first landscape ecology conference in Athens um, back in 86. But this discussion and even celebration of disturbance that can somehow um, help resilience, right? And this is Professor Pardue again, keeping me up to speed with the panarchy model. But it seems to me what we're doing in disturbing through dredging and then whatever argument you can make in terms of adaptation to strengthen a system, the, water, the oxygenation is that adaptation. So there is no strengthening of the system. It's sort of, it's, it's production of nature on both sides. You're disturbing and somehow adapting for it, if that, even if you could justify it that way. Um, so new practices. Um, again, the engineering with nature and Jekyll Island, they're using some of this dredge to try to um, try to work with subsidence as well as gain beach, right? When you go to the beach, you like to have a little bit of sand. Um, that, of course, gets redone again and again. So I think these kinds of practices are, are helpful. I think they're, the core recognizes them as important. I think they're still kind of baby steps to the larger project, the pro challenge, I guess I'll say. Um, and then from geography, and again, it's kind of the social sciences, but um, Young Ray Choi talks about slippery ontologies and tidal flats. Uh, and that way, sort of, we're thinking of tidal areas. She proposes the, the tidal flat, sometimes water, t sometimes land, um, as something that we need to sort of understand not through binary categories, that there's ways to understand 
and perhaps through new categories and categorical breakdown, we begin to understand the dynamism and respect it more in that way. Um, other than say what essentially is a roadway. Instead of paving it and getting a budget to get asphalt and pave it periodically, we dredge it. But that of course doesn't recognize it as a habitat that, that it is. Another one is from Australia, again, speaking with the river, when we're talking about sounding, right? Speaking with the river is an interdisciplinary symposium um, to try to think of research practices uh, for, with new understandings of rivers and river systems for environmental, cultural, historical, and economic, or as those kinds of phenomena. Um, some colleagues and I are at the, from the art department as well as across the world have put together this group called Port Futures and Social Logistics where we had, a, we had an event on Earth Day last April for which people did 4D representations of material culture and, and, and environmental engagement. So maybe this too represents new methods and understandings Limited, of course. I mean, we need to, we have to think about how it impacts practice, but I think important. Um, again, this Port City Futures that I talked about, we, they just celebrated in October uh, the 150th anniversary of the new waterway, which sort of helped create modern, the modern Netherlands in terms of dredging and access, but it's, people are beginning to say, well, maybe we need to think of new possibilities in terms of shipping channel um, dredging and what we've done so far. And then I'll end on this one because the tree that owns itself here in Athens, um, Dorinda Dahlmeyer, who, who as, when I first arrived here was very helpful and very, very generous. Uh, and she, uh, I don't know if she launched it. It's now in Alfie's hand, very capable hands. But she, when I was here, she was the environmental ethics uh, program director. And she had done, she used this reference a lot in, in the way she talked about ocean rights and how we should begin to conceive of the rights of the ocean, not merely as something we can instrumentalize, but actually uh, through a kind of an autonomy, right? Um, and so it's, it's the fact that here in 1832, uh, someone gave a tree to itself, perhaps this, uh, perhaps this can inspire us in these ways, uh, thinking about what that new relationship might mean. Um, and eventually, what, if it turns into practice. So this, this is by James Enos, this fo photo. So you see the bird and the wetland, and you can see the port there in the background. Um, and finally, it's in memory of Ort, who sadly passed on Saturday, who was a Athens, Georgia um, scenester, who will be dearly missed. Thank you all for your attention.